Solidarity Movement, Jesse Neville. Maru and Jamie, good to be here. The Maru Conference. Good to be here with you. So we wanted to welcome everyone out there who has tuned in to tonight's webinar, mm -hmm. the title of which is The Crisis of Climate Change, Capitalism and Genocide. And these webinars are part of a series of webinars in conjunction with the Black Power It's an honor to be here with you, Chairman Penny. Um, and we wanted to let everyone know who has joined us for this webinar, this uh, web show, that uh, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement is an organization that was formed by the African People's Socialist Party, the vanguard of the African working class and African Revolution International, as a way to interject the African Revolution into the heart of the white community and indeed into the oppressor population, into the white population itself. We are directly under the leadership of and a strategic component of the African revolutionary struggle. And our main task as white people who are part of the African revolution is to win reparations from our fellow white people. Reparations as a stance of self-criticism for years of colonialism, slavery, outright theft and brutality that can barely be described. Yes. And this is a rapidly growing movement that would not exist without the African People's Socialist Party and its co-founder and chairman, Chairman Omalia Shetela, under whose leadership we work. And I just want to salute Chairman Omalia Shetela right now. Chairman. <laughs> theorist and activist and leader in the world today. He has been struggling tirelessly to unite Africa and African people under the leadership of the African working class for the past 50 years. Yes. And tonight we also would be remiss if we did not salute the on the ground leader of the economic work of the African People's Socialist Party, Deputy Chair Onazene Yeshitela. <laughs> Resources, 
their lives and their destinies. And tonight, we take this stance of reparations and we do it toward the Black Power blueprint. And our goal tonight is to raise $500. This is a fundraiser for the programs of the Black Power Blueprint. And let's just briefly, for anyone who may not be familiar with it, this incredibly optimistic and revolutionary program. The Black Power Blueprint is a self-determination program of Black Star Industries and the African People's Education and Defense Fund, which is building political and economic power in the hands of the African working class. The Black Power Blueprint is located at 4101 West Florissant Avenue in St. Louis, Missouri, where Comrade Chairwoman Penny Hess is joining us tonight. Mm. And with your support over the past year and a half, this program has really surged forward with just a lightning speed of development yes, uh, under the leadership of Deputy Chair Ona Zene in St. Louis through the St. Louis Land Reutilization Authority, or LRA, APEDF, or the African People's Education and Defense Fund, has acquired a new property. It is located at 4368 College Avenue, just a few blocks uh, down from Florissant Avenue from the Uhuru House. And the Black Power Blueprint will be demolishing yet another condemned building and will use the land for future projects. The Black Power Blueprint is working again with Andre and Trish Heron of the JAF Construction, who are applying for demolition per permits at 4368 College Avenue. So JAF Construction yes. is coordinated, uh, has coordinated the demolition of the properties across the street from the Uhuru House at the uh, home of the, the future One Africa, One Nation Marketplace and uh, Gary Brooks Community Garden. The third floor of the St. Louis Uhuru House has gotten its finishing touches as it well. It looks amazing. It looks beautiful. Did you want to say anything about that? Having uh, no, I, been there? I have the honor of seeing it. It looks amazing. It's shiny and beautiful and being set up for offices and just looks spectacular. Fantastic. You know, I, I loved during the convention, uh, Chair Jesse noted that the setup for the convention, there was virtually no work involved. Because it's so stylish and so, so nice. beautiful as it is constructed, it is a gorgeous space, and mm -hmm. I'm certain that the third floor is equally beautiful. So Chantel, who owns, and forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, uh, who owns Butler Painting, did the final staining, painting, and hanging of blinds and curtains. Furniture was moved in, and now it's ready for use as an office space and forwarding the work of African self-determination. And it is your work. The people tuning in who have gone to blackpowerblueprint.org, that is still the place where we go, right, uh, that makes this possible. Your stance of support for African self-determination and your stance of reparations if you are a white person like us in the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And tonight we are committed, as has been stated, to raise $500 for this absolutely critical project. Uhuru. Jamie, if I may, I, I just want to appreciate the, the overview for this amazing web show tonight. And I really want to salute Chairwoman Penny Hess, who we're going to be uh, hearing from, who leads the Black Power Blueprint Reparations Committee and who recently relocated, you know, with the National Office of APSC to St. Louis to work as part of the Black Power Blueprint and to build there in, you know, the headquarters of the the reemergence of the African Revolution. So yes. I want to salute Chairwoman Penny. And um, this topic that we're going to be hearing about tonight from Chairwoman Penny Hess was actually my introduction to this movement. I uh, saw a program for a conference at New College in Sarasota where Chairwoman Penny was speaking on the issue of colonialism is killing the environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, like many white people out there who are concerned about what we see happening to the planet Earth and want to do something about it, and are disillusioned by you know Al Gore and his, his uh, PowerPoint presentations and his laser pointer and whatever, um, and and we want something real. You know, this was a breath of fresh air. I remember when I saw uh, this presentation. So I'm very excited for that tonight. And before we turn it over to Chairwoman Penny, I do want to um, let people know that we have people tuning in right now. We want to thank all of you who are watching. We have people tuning in from Spokane, from Boston. We have uh, St. Louis, Louisville, Kentucky, Gainesville, Florida, Asheville, North Carolina, and we also have Trinidad in the Caribbean, right. so Peru, um, as well as uh, St. Pete. We have people tuning in online from St. Pete, and we also have a live studio audience 
that has pulled together our live studio audience had a meeting before this web show and we agreed to make a matching a collective matching fund of one hundred dollars so um basically what we're saying is that we want to get we want to encourage everybody here to contribute up to at least four hundred dollars and then we will put in the final 100 to top it off. And then we can even go beyond 500 because the resources are urgently needed for these critical projects. And I do want to appreciate Janice Kant, who got us started with $50. So who are you, uh, yeah. That's right. As much as you, as soon as you get us to $400, that 400 unlocks itself and magically becomes Five hundred dollars. <laughs> yes, through the mysticism, unlock the magic fund. That's right. You can make that happen. And how do people do that? Uh, you go to blackpowerblueprint.org is how you do it. There's no magic or mystery to it. You pull out your debit card, you punch in your numbers, and reparations to the Black Power Blueprint. And again, this is um, this is what this is about. This is actually we're going to understand by the end of this program tonight. You're going to understand how. The real stance in defense of the environment and the resources of the planet Earth is the Black Power Blueprint. Yes. That is the answer. So true. And we want to turn now to a presentation. I really want to echo Chair Jesse's salute of Chairman Penny Hess, Chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee, the original organization for white people who yes. wanted to uh, answer the call to not just become allies, not just to be a support group, but to actually join the strategy of the African revolution and become an integral part of it. And Chairwoman Penny took on that call from 1976, and she has never looked back. Yes. And without that stance, I seriously doubt whether we would be here today. Right. So we cannot overstate that. And we want to turn to a presentation now by Chairman Penny Hess of the African People's Solidarity Committee. Penny Hess, who has written and spoken extensively on the issue specifically of climate change and environmental destruction as a symptom of colonialism for decades. Chairman Penny Hess, it is so great to have you here joining us yeah. live from the host city of the Black Power Blueprint in St. Louis, Missouri. The Guru Chairman Penny Hess. Guru Chairman Hero. Penny. Hero. Really great to be here, Uhuru, Comrade Jamie, Uhuru, Chair Jesse. It is uh, very powerful to be able to be part of this tonight and to especially to be here at the, uh, at the Uhuru House, the Quaba Hall, um, as the centerpiece, as has been said, of the Black Power Blueprint here in north side of St. Louis at 4101 West Florissant Avenue and that this uh, program, the Black Power Blueprint, is unique in the entire United States and in the world in that it, this is about the empowerment and dual and contending political and economic power in the hands of the African working class. This is what is going on here. It is led by the African People's Socialist Party. So. Um, you know, first of all, I want to join in saluting Chairman Omali Ishitela, who is the chair of the African People's Socialist Party, and who, by the way, um, he, he spoke at, at Oxford in a debate in January at Oxford University in Britain, and won that debate hands down. Um, and the video from that, by the way, is going viral and has yeah. at least um, 650,000 views around the world. So this is happening yes. even as we're speaking. We can be in a meeting and it goes up by another, you know, 5,000 wh yeah. while we're sitting here. So, you know, the word is getting out there and this is circulating on the continent of Africa. People are hearing the chairman's message. So. I urge you to go to Chairman O'Malley Chatella's Facebook page if you have not done that, and um, and you know you can see these different videos that are, are are different versions of the videos that are circulating. So, you know I I do um, want to salute Chairman O'Malley Chatella, who is the leadership of the African People's Solidarity Committee, who uh, formed the African People's Solid Solidarity Committee as part of the strategy of the African People's Socialist Party to win the absolute and complete and total 
unification of African people everywhere and the liberation and unification of Africa and all its resources. As part of that strategy, it had the plan, the, um, the, the goal to extend the African Revolution into the heart of white society in a way that it couldn't do. It, and it was doing that to win white people ourselves to become unified um, have total unity with the party's um, political theory of African internationalism and to begin to see the world through the eyes of the African working class and to embrace that and therefore to come to the same conclusions that the party has, that we as white people sit on the pedestal of the oppression and exploitation of African people, the indigenous people and the theft of their land and, and the colonization of the majority of the planet this is why everything that we have comes from this, that parasitic capitalism was formed by Europe's assault on Africa and African people and the subsequent genocide of the indigenous people and, and colonization of the world. This was the birth of capitalism. This is where it started. And we as white people owe reparations to African people. This is critical. This is the bottom line. So when I'm talking about climate change, I'm talking about reparations, and I want to say more about that. I also want to join in saluting Deputy Chair Ona Zene Isatella, who has been said is the architect, as she is called, of the Black Power Blueprint. She took the words, the vision of Chairman Omale Isatella and put it on the ground, made it a reality. And there's so many different fronts of this. And by the way, next Tuesday night, the Black Power Blueprint will be hosting a webinar at the same time in which Deputy Chair Ona Zene Ishitala will be the featured speaker um, talking about the upcoming projects, summing up the success of the ones that have happened now, and uh, you know what's going to be happening in the next few months. Very exciting. Also with her will be uh, Tucharo Masimba, who is the economic development specialist of her office, as well as Kitty Riley from the African People's Solidarity Committee, who is the project director for for the different projects. So it's very exciting as far as that goes. I want to start by saying, you know, when we look at this situation of climate change, there is no difference between any other, um, you know, between the cause of this and the cause of colonialism, of terror, of mass genocide, of of the, the um, slaughter and, and murder and rape and pillage of oppressed and colonized peoples, of African people, and, um, you know, and, and basically of the entire planet. It's all part of the same thing. And if we do not see that, then once again, we are, we are struggling for something as a white right. Because the majority of the planet, of, you know, of this planet, the majority of human beings, the colonized peoples have already experienced extinction have already been threatened by, you know, for thousands of years by their environment um, from the bison, you know, and the buffalo of the indigenous people here wiped out as part of the genocide to, um, you know, just to even the, what they call the des desertification of Africa, um, the fact that Africa is forced to to grow monocrops for the benefit of Europe and not to feed their people. I mean, just every single thing that you know, we can identify as climate change is a result of the same process of parasitic capitalism. And this we have learned from Chairman O'Malley Chatella. And I want to say here, on the north side of, of St. Louis, this is an amazing, um, an amazing community here, an African community in a town that is 50% African, 50% white, and um, which actually in reality, you know, it's, it seems much greater percentage African, and they often do lie on that. But in any case, the majority of the African community lives north of what is called the Del Mar Divide. And that is a very stark difference um, between the conditions in the white community, which are affluent, in which the average white family here has, has assets of $164,000. That's the average. The average African 
family has less than $16,000. And I, I really believe that that is an overestimation put out because yes. the national average for the African population is 3,600. And in some places like Boston, it's $5. That's how much yep. assets the average African family has. So, you know, I don't know, you know what they're saying, but I do believe that the average white family has $164,000. Now we're talking about an African community where Mike Brown, this is, you know, only a few miles from where Mike Brown was killed in 2014 slaughtered um, by the police department in such a brutal way, shot down in the street where, where he lived, right, you know, in his neighborhood, um, and, you know, shot by the police in the middle of the afternoon in an August day, and his body was left on the pavement for more than four hours to bleed out as, an, as to be an example um, of what can happen to any African that would attempt to just live their life under colonialism. So, you know, that sparked huge resistance. But, you know, this community, I mean, just look at the difference between the north side and the south side. And they have something called the Del Mar Divide. Del Mar Avenue is, is an avenue. And when you cross it going south, there's mansions right there, gated mansions. You cross it going north, and it is incredible poverty, just a few blocks away, you know. so. You're talking about a police containment that exists to the extent that buildings are burnt out up here. Um, there is deep poverty, and um, you know, and there's uh, there, there's just nothing. There's no grocery stores. There's not even trees. All the trees are on the south side. There's yeah. not even trees here. You know, this is um, it, it's it's very stark. It's very stark. And in fact, when we talk about the environment, we have to raise this that as, uh, recently there was an exposure in the last few years that in the 1950s, the Army, the U.S. Army, conducted so-called tests of radioactive materials onto the public housing, the largest public housing project in the north side of, of St. Louis, and did that by taking huge blowers on the roofs of these housing housing projects and blowing them out into that neighborhood, into that, actually that housing, you know, the yard or whatever, um, that had toxic and radioactive dust and toxic chemicals. And whole African families died of cancer and, you know, just the illness and all of the situation that existed there. This is what this government did. That's climate change. That has to do with that. And it's certainly also the fact that this city, St. Louis, um, did, um, what do you call it, cured or whatever it is, the uranium for the Manhattan Project for the atomic bomb and dumped radioactive waste on the north side, which is not far from here, and is still an open pit. It's called a uh, a super fund, which is such a euphemism for a, a completely deadly toxic waste dump of radioactive materials that is open and that, that floods over into streams and yards where children play and they knew this and they don't do anything about it. That's what, you know, so do we separate that from the state that this, that this planet is in? No, we cannot do that. So. You know, I just want to say that this is part of the crisis of imperialism and that it's suddenly something that white people have noted, have seen, and white pe young white people are very, very concerned about this question of climate change now. And there's even this thing called white climate grief. Um, and it's depression and even suicide, suicide rate growing among young white people and, yeah. you know, because obviously imperialism itself is in a crisis and because the climate's not going to be for this upcoming generation what it, what it was even, you know, certainly for my generation and, and others, for white yeah. people. So that even what imperialism has done to the rest of humanity, we are not separate from that. You know, this is one planet, one ecosystem, 
And of course, we ourselves are, are going to experience this, but this is, you know, this is what imperialism does. So, you know, we can look at the, the yes, there is a very, very desperate um, situation with the climate right now, and it's getting worse every day, every year, and every decade, it is getting worse. We see the, the massive fires, like we saw last year in California, but also raging forest fires in the Arctic Circle for the first time ever. Um, in, in Denmark, in Sweden, in, you know, way up in the Arctic Circle, there's fires. They, there's forest fires going on there. They've never had that before. We see storms, unpredictable weather, which we certainly have here in St. Louis. We see droughts. We see floods. Um, we just, we just, it's just constant. It's constant, you know, that we're seeing what this is doing. And what we see is scientists, white and European scientists saying, that this, thought, this climate change is abrupt, and it's all happening so much faster than they thought. They just didn't realize how fast this was going, and you know, they predicted certain things would happen by the end of this 21st century, but in fact, it's happening now. It's happening now. And you know, what some scientists have stated is that they have begin, begun to, um, to, to study the previous eras of climate change, which I think there were at least six or five other periods in remote history in which the climate changed very, very drastically and, um, and, and major, almost all species were wiped out. And, you know, they're saying that, that that kind of climate change didn't happen over a period of eons or years, but it's often happened in a period of weeks, of weeks and months. It happened very quickly, and this is what we're seeing, is this rapid, um, profound change. And, we, you know, we have certain numbers of, of uh, scientists who are even saying human, the human beings are going to go extinct, et cetera. So there's this, this um, you know, tremendous pessimism and fear and sadness, et cetera. So, you know, I just want to look at that. And I want to say, first of all, I do want to say a couple of things that are happening for people that don't know. And, and one is that the Earth has not been this hot for 120,000 years. Um, the temperature has not been what it is. And when you talk about, you know, global warming, you're talking about maybe only a few centimeters of heat different. Maybe only two. In fact, that is what they're talking about. Two centimeters difference between an ice age and a heat, you know, a time of, of global hot, hot, um, heat. So human beings have been on this planet in, in the state we're in for about 50,000 years. So we have, human beings have never lived when it is this hot. And the fact that it's happening this rapidly makes any kind of, of adjustment to that very, very difficult. And there's never been this amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for 800,000 years. So in other times, they had different names for those periods. But the, this period, this global climate change is called Anthropocene. Anthropocene, which means human caused, human caused. So that's officially what the name of it is for now. It's human caused climate change, but the fact is, it is not correct to call it human, human yeah. this, because it is capitalism. It is capitalism. Yeah. And until we come to this understanding, until all of these white people who are so concerned about this come to this reality come to the conclusion that cli the climate will never be saved under, under capitalism. I don't care how many solar panels and wind turbines and all that stuff that you build, it will never, never, never change under capitalism because capitalism has one goal, and that is to make a profit. And they will, as, you know, as Lenin said, sell you the rope to hang them with. So what's happening under this period now is this rapid melting of the glaciers in both 
the Arctic Circle, and now they're finding in Antarctica because they were saying, well, it's melting in the, in, you know, the Arctic, but everything's fine in Antarctica. No, it isn't. It's melting there too. And they found huge, huge gaps and melting of the ice. So what does that mean? It means first, there's several things that happen when the glaciers melt. And one of them is that the whiteness, the, um, the, the ice of the glaciers and the ice and snow reflected the sun's rays and heat back up into the atmosphere. But when that's gone and the ocean is blue, the ocean absorbs the heat. So it is heating the ocean. The ocean is, is heating the planet and it can't be, um, you know, they, ca they can't reflect it back. And so that's one of the things that happens. So also when the glaciers melt, it means that the sea level rises and the sea level has not risen yet as much as it's going to at the rate that the glaciers are melting. So, but we do see that there's, there's many islands, there's already island nations of indigenous peoples in the Pacific Ocean who've had to leave their islands because of sea level rise. And in fact, in the United States, in the state of Louisiana, which is on the Gulf of Mexico, that a football field worth of land is being taken over by the Gulf every hour, every hour, another football field worth of land is being taken over. And many, many people have already had to move out of, you know, their coastal regions of Louisiana. So this is, you know, this is real. And then the third thing that happens with the melting of the ice caps is this release of methane gas. And methane gas is a, a CO2, it's a carbon dioxide gas that, um, that w is much more powerful in the short term. It's not as long lived as other forms, but it is more powerful in the short term for, um, uh, for heating the planet. It brings more CO2 to the atmosphere the stratosphere than, um, than any other form of CO2. So what happens is that with the melting, then all of the, um, you know, frozen fossils and leaves and all the things that were under the ice and have been under there for 100,000 100, years and more are now being exposed and that both in the ocean and on the land. And these um, fossilized and, and you know, leaves and all this detritus, et cetera, create methane. And they are the greatest purveyor of methane in the world right now. And as this melts, as the ice melts, they shoot off this methane into the stratosphere. And, and it's much more intense. And they're saying that there's so, that in fact, certain seas in the Arctic are bubbling with this methane. They're bubbling with the methane. And if this methane would do a rapid release, which is highly probable, and many scientists have said it could happen, that would in itself would warm, abruptly warm the planet um, by several degrees. So, you know, so there's very serious problems to solve. Uh, also in this, and I'm just going to go over, you know, certain things, but to sum up, there are 200 species of animals going extinct every single day. Every single day. There's also what's called the insect Armageddon, where in um, different studies from Germany to Puerto Rico to the Amazon, they found that, um, that, that insects, up to 80 to 97 percent of insects are dead. They're gone. And, you know, for us to say that, you know, this is a, a food chain, this is a, um, an environment in which all living things are interconnected, there's no way humans can live if insects don't live. And, you know, you can, you can even look at yourself when, I remember when I was a child, in the summer, if the porch light was on and you came home, there were like 50,000 bugs flying around that light. You don't see that anymore. And you go on a trip and you don't see your windshield covered with dead, dead insects anymore. And I mean, that's just, you know, um, 
your own experience, but that is part of it. So there's the insect apocalypse. There's also the fact that they're calling the oceans now, they're calling them deserts because, um, let's say, the Pacific Ocean, all the abalone is gone. The kelp forest, which grew, the kelp, which harbored and sheltered the abalone and the starfish, are gone. And the starfish have all died. And every time that they're finding, you know, these massive, um, you know, die-offs of seabirds and fish and even whales and dolphins and, you know, the larger, the larger species, um, they, they're, just, they're just dying off. I just read of one today. They're just, they, it was like any given day, you just see they just die like crazy. And then when they cut them open and give them an autopsy, they're finding that their entire inner organs are full of plastic, and there's so much plastic in the ocean, um, you know, from all this plastic bottles and all that sort of thing. You know, these are some of the things that we're talking about. There's so much, I think there's, it's equal to the United States in the amount of, of coverage of the ocean by these islands of plastic that are now floating around. Um, this is real, and, and what's being said is that the habitat for human beings to live is gone. So how, what happens, you know, is this going to be solved by this children's marches that you see in um, Europe and... No. You know, all this kind of thing. No, no way. Because if the only thing that is going to solve it is, first of all, we have to look at the reality of parasitic capitalism. It went out um, as a scourge of destruction against African indigenous people and the Philippines and China and Arab countries and, you know, the majority of the planet Earth just that so many human people and society, human beings and societies have already gone extinct. In fact, I read an article that was in the UK Guardian in January saying that in, um, in the 1600s, because remember Christopher Columbus sailed to, um, to the Western Hemisphere and to the Caribbean Islands in 1492, um, and um, in, the, in the name of Portugal and Spain as a conqueror, conquistador, to, um, to be able to, you know, steal the resources of, you know, the indigenous people and began instant genocide. So between 1492 and the year 1600, in that century, so many indigenous people were slaughtered by this genocide that it caused a mini ice age. It caused a mini ice age. And, you know, just think about that. It, it got colder. And it got, the reason it got colder is because 56 million indigenous people were slaughtered in that time period. I mean, you know, they talk about, you know, Nazi Germany. This is what, you know, this is what Europeans did. We slaughtered so many societies, we wiped out societies, we killed human beings, we raped, we plundered, we stole everything they had. And so what happened was all of their farmland in that hundred years went back to forests, and it was those forests, <clears throat> which, which it is true that the growing of trees absorbs carbon dioxide out of the air and puts it back in the soil. So it turned, it was so great that it turned the entire world into freezing and, and an ice age that went on for another hundred years, you know, and you read about this. This happened in the Middle Ages. <clears throat> so, I mean, this is so profound. This is so profound. And, you know, what they're saying today, what the scientists are saying, without any sense of irony or anything, is that the global warming period dates to the year 1750. And, you know, to, to, well, why 1750? And they're saying that that's the start of the Industrial Revolution. And it was the Industrial Revolution that, um, that began using fossil fuels like oil and gas as the major heating fuel. And these are, you know, uh, great 
um, purveyors of carbon dioxide and CO2 into the atmosphere. And this is when the global warming started. But wait a minute, 1750, that was the height of, or you know, certainly a very high point of the assault on Africa, of the, of the uh, turning of African people into commodities, of, you know, of the enslavement of African people, the forced labor, this is what created the industrial revolution. And just that, you know, that people would start talking about the year 1750 and never talk about what was happening then. Why did that, why did that happen? You know, why? What was the cause of all of a sudden this industrial revolution in Europe and North America? It happened because of the assault on Africa, the theft of African human beings, creating a world economy this parasitic capitalism. So there's one trajectory. And you know, as white people, we are always separating things out so that it's all about us. Well, right. we are the ones that had the ability to live, to come to America, to step up on the backs of African people, to step up on the backs of the, of the stolen land of the indigenous people, which you know, this US government gave out millions of acres of land to white people who would just go out there, kill indigenous people, and settle that land and have it. I mean, everything that we have is at the expense of African indigenous people who are already, already affected by climate change. They already had their extinction, their Armageddon. And, you know, um, so, People, you know, one of the things that, that I hear is I hear people, environmentalists say, well, all we have to do is start, you know, having more solar panels. We have to get rid of the fossil fuels. And all we have to do is do this and do that. But wait a minute, you know, that is so typical of white people. There is a state, there is a state. We don't experience it. But oppressed and colonized people feel this state all around the world. A colonized people inside the borders of the United States feel the state, the Pentagon, the bombs. The US has the largest military in the world. We have nuclear power. The US has nuclear power. It has, um, it has drones. It has huge armies. It has arsenals of every type of chemical and biological weaponry, and it uses it on oppressing colonized people here and around the world. We don't experience it. And you know, like we don't we don't change this economy by just saying, oh, let's 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 do this. No. Because I want to say by the way that the oil industry in the world is 1.7 trillion dollars in profit. 1.7 trillion dollars. That is three times larger, the oil industry, than the revenues of all other men, minerals and metals combined, three times larger. And the, we know that the oil industry is all in there, in the US state, in the Pentagon, the US government. You know, it's number one. They're not going to give up that. There's no way they're going to do that. And you know, just to say that, I mean, by comparison, Gold, which is the largest metal sales in the entire world, is only one tenth of the revenue of what it, the revenue is for oil and the oil industry around the world. Illegal drugs, which is huge, but that's only $321 billion. We're talking about $1.7 trillion. So, you know, you know, just to say that every white child that comes onto this planet uses 30 five times the resources of any other child around the world. Any other child around the world. And yet we're talking about climate change. The only way this climate is going to change is for US imperialism to be destroyed. I mean, these people are talking about things like, well, we have to get rid of airplane travel. We have to get rid of all cars. What? Imperialism is never going to do that. We'd have to get rid of the internet. You know, the, the nothing that, you know, that uses fossil fuels can be used. That is never going to happen under imperialism, period. And it's only going to happen through the leadership of the African working class to win back Africa in the hands 
of the African working class to reunite Africa. And as the chairman has clearly said, that the party is very serious about taking power. That's what they're doing right here in, in St. Louis on the north side. And this is yeah. extended into the world arena and into the continent of Africa. And I'll tell you this, that all these 650,000, and by tomorrow it'll be a, a million people who have heard the chairman, many of them are in Africa and the continent of Africa. This is sweeping it, sweeping that continent, and we will see a uh, revolution in our lifetime. And it is never going to be white people. It is never going to be imperialism. It is never going to be capitalism that solves this problem. It will take no, no. the entire world and themselves with it down. They don't care. They want their money. They have their bunkers or whatever they think they're going to live in some bunker. But I will tell you this, that African and indigenous people have the resilience. They have the genius. They have, they have lived under this assault on their, you know, on their humanity, on their ability to produce, to, to produce and reproduce real life for 600 years. Um, they, they've found a way to live, to thrive, to have their culture, to fight for their liberation. And this is what is going to change the world. It is never going to be anybody from white power. And the best thing the best thing that we can do if we want to fight climate change is pay reparations to the African yes. Revolution because the African Revolution is taking everybody with them that wants to be part of a new world in which this planet itself can survive because it will be led in the interests of human beings and not profit and not rape and not plunder that this will be the end of war and the ability of the genius of African people whose mere survival was an act of genius right. to, um, to be able to um, put their, their brilliance into solving this problem and along with the indigenous people of the Americas who were the custodians of the Western Hemisphere and the Caribbean you know, for 10,000 years. And, um, you know, that there was never a problem with the ozone level and all that kind of thing when, when they had their power over their lives. And when we're talking about, you know, oppressed and colonized peoples around the world coming to power, destroying white power, we can either be part of that or we can go down in the melting ice with imperialism itself because African people are going to be free. They're going to they're gonna liberate this planet and they're going to be able to create a world that solves all the problems that imperialism left them and um, has the ability for a true habitat for all of humanity to flourish once and for all through power in the hands of the African and oppressed working class of the world. We owe reparations. If we put reparations, we return the stolen resources into the hands of the African revolution. We are saying, that is my stand for a world that will survive, a world that will be led, that world of peace, a world of uh, end to war, end of the oppressor and the oppressed. So that is the solution. Reparations to the Black Power Blueprint, reparations to the African Revolution. That is in our deepest interest. So Uhuru and unity through reparations. Reparations. Uhuru. you're joining us just now, you're tuning in to the Uhuru Solidarity Movement's uh, bi-monthly webinar, and uh, this issue is called Climate Change uh, Crisis. Roots Capit of Climate Change. In capitalism. Capitalism. Yeah. Yes. Uhuru. <laughs> Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, Jamie, if I may, I wanted to uh, really appreciate you another one. Yeah, that was so funny. It's just so great to have this analysis from African internationalism, the worldview of the African People's Socialist Party, and, you know, to be able to have that articulation from Chairwoman Penny Hess of APSC. And I know that there are a lot of white people out there who are really tired of this phony environmentalist movement that is out there. And, you know, because I was one of those people, like, I was concerned about the environment, but I knew that recycling wasn't going to do in the environment. Or, you know, I can go get a plastic water bottle, but it's an eco-friendly plastic water bottle and 
just the way you were saying, Penny, about how capitalism only cares about one thing and one thing alone, which is profit. And in the pursuit of profit, they will even create, they will even co-opt, you know, environmentalism and conserve the environment and basically become green capitalists. Yes. And, um, and, you know, if you're one of those people out there who is experiencing climate grief, you are now a market demographic that capitalism will develop <laughs> new products to sell, some, sell to you. So... Um, this is the only analysis that makes sense and that shows that capitalism itself is the problem. And I love what you said, that Anthropocene, you know, climate change, that is that is a misnomer. It's, you know, it's white people, white people, you know, not humans. And that's a line that you see a lot. There's a, oh, humans have destroyed the right. planet Earth. Right. Well, humans were doing all right for uh, a long time, thousands yeah. of years with the planet Earth while we were you know, had not yet mastered fire in Europe. So yes, obviously exactly. that's not the issue. So I really appreciate that, that whole analysis. And I unite that for those of us who are genuinely concerned about the environment, you know, we have to pay reparations. We have to stand in solidarity with the African revolution because even some proponents of capitalism have been forced to admit that to really deal with the climate change crisis would necessitate the overthrow of capitalism. Mm -hmm. But they say it in a kind of do, gloom and doom kind of way, like, <laughs> we're screwed because, the, I mean, if we wanted to deal with this climate change issue, we would have to overthrow the whole system, you know? And it's like, well, yeah, you're right, we would. <laughs> right. And we're not sad about that. That's what needs to happen. And an African, mm -hmm. you know, the African revolution is what's going to make that happen. So that's why we're having this, this web event to raise reparations for the Black Power Blueprint and... You know, we also have people tuning in from uh, Bangladesh, so we want to give a shout out to our international yeah. audience tonight. <laughs> and we wanted to salute Pete Yarashuk, who put in $25, a guru to Pete Yarashuk. <laughs> so we have San Francisco watching tonight. David Rold in Boston put in $25. So Woo, David! We have Tama Gadini put in $10, a guru to <laughs> We, we expect to be seeing a lot of Tama in the upcoming weeks here in St. Pete. And we also have a, a statement from David Rold. He says, we need black power in order for the world to survive the climate change and pollution that white power, imperialist capitalism has created. Yes. Well so said. Can you hear me? Wow. Yeah. Great. So we also have uh, Jackson Hollingsworth. We put in $10. A guru to Comrade Jackson. All right. We have uh, Santos here in St. Pete who put in five dollars. Woo, Santos. Santos! We have Lisa Watson who put in twenty-five dollars. We have Renee Nassar here in St. Pete put in fifteen dollars. Uhuru Renee. Uhuru Renee. And we want to shout out Polly, who is one of our Black Car Blueprint monthly sustainers. And oh, did you know, right. Jamie? that you can actually sign up as a monthly sustainer to the Black Power Blueprint. That means yes. you sign up on blackpowerblueprint.org and money comes out of your account every month as reparations to the Black Power Blueprint. You don't even have to worry about it. Every month, you're paying reparations mm -hmm. on a schedule every single month. So we want to encourage people to do that. Polly is one of our sustainers, so salute to Polly. And I just want to say, Chairwoman Penny and comrades here in our audience, that we have raised... $235, right. which means we only have to raise $165 in, only, in order to unlock our $100 matching fund. That's All right. right. Well, so I, 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 want to raise, I want to give $25 tonight. Oh, oh, and sure. is there anybody else here in uh, Aquaba Hall, St. Louis? I just put in 10. All right. Oh, you put All in right. KC. KC. Fantastic. That's thirty-five awesome. more dollars towards yes. the Black Power Blueprint, and if you're interested in taking the same stance that uh, Comrade Polly took, yes, uh, in becoming a monthly standard, you can find out information on that at BlackPowerBlueprint.org. The same location you go to support the fundraising goal that we're striving toward tonight. Now, I, just say, that, I just wanted to say something. Yes. You know that that this, as you know, as Deputy Chair in, in one of the videos says. You know, that, that the Black Power Blueprint is such an optimistic program. Yeah, yeah. It brings joy and optimism to see this 50-foot this flagpole right across the street and the 25-foot red, black, and green African flag. I mean, everybody 
Everybody knew, knows that. All, all the entire African community knows about it. And when, on the days when the flag is raised here by the members of the party in the Uhuru movement, it stops traffic. People just stop. This is a very busy street. They just stop, sometimes stop their car right in the middle of the street and start saluting, taking pictures, bringing their children out to be photographed with it. I mean, it's really, it's, it's so clear that, you know, it's so beautiful and optimistic and, and there's, you know, just the struggle for power. To have the power over their lives is very, very powerful to see, and it's in our interest. This is the side of history I want to be on, and I think yeah. you do too. Absolutely. Thank you, Sharon Penny. And while you are all going to blackpowerblueprint.org and putting in your contributions, we only need to raise $200 more in order to tap into our $100 uh, matching fund contributed by the anonymous donor collective of our live studio audience here in St. Petersburg, So, <laughs> which we, we will also reveal their identities uh, at the end of the program. So go ahead and contribute we only need to raise two hundred dollars and while you're doing that um can we show the slides of we wanted to show you what your money goes towards when you pay reparations to the black power blueprint and how instantly the resources are translated into tangible results on the ground in the black power blueprint projects coordinated by deputy chair otis nay i should tell us so we want to show you some some before and after pictures this is from a presentation put together by the office of Chairwoman Penny Hess, and I don't know if that's on the screen right now. So, um, you know, so we're looking it at. It is. It is on the screen right now. Okay, great. So, you know, you can see the beautiful Uhuru House, and it's a magnificent building inside and out. It's amazing, and just such a, a stellar institution of the African working class there in St. Louis. These are very nice pictures. Somebody's asking, where do you get the stolen from Africa shirts? You go to planetuhuru.com. That's right. All right, so you can see inside here, you can see it was, you know, in pretty bad shape. And then the power of the African working class transforming their conditions. And by the way, I want to shout out Dylan Voss there in St. Louis who put in $10. Uhuru, for Uhuru, All right, Dylan. Uhuru, Dylan. Uhuru, Uhuru. And now look at this shiny, sparkling, beautiful Aquaba Hall. And it, it is amazing. And it's true. Decor for your event is easy. Just mm -hmm. put some tables up. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. So this is, all right, you see the stage? Amazing red, beautiful stage with the African design. I love the brick incorporated yes. in there. It's the length of that building. This is the Black Power Blueprint in effect. And this was part of the first phase of the Black Power Blueprint. So you can see, okay, then there was the demolition of the buildings. This was in phase two, demolishing two condemned buildings across the street. And it took, I think, around $20,000 to make that happen. And you made it happen, those of you who are watching, who contributed reparations to this project. And the end result of that, here you can see they you know, brought down the buildings. Which is no small feat. African really workers, African contractors. Wow, before and after. Yep. And that's not so, even the final. We have more more changes. Oh yeah. Yeah, so that's this is before and then sort of intermediate. And then you'll see the most recent stage. So while you're looking at this, if you want to be part of this, if you want to be part of real transformation that is happening under the leadership of the African working class, blackpowerblueprint.org is where you can go and put in your reparations so that we can raise at least $190 more before the end of our web show tonight. So there you see the red, black, and green. Wow. And I just wanted to mention, you know, the red, black, and green is the official African, you know, is the official flag of the African nation not just in the world, but specifically in St. Louis, you see that flag everywhere. You see that flag painted on trash cans. You see that flag in the YMCA. Mm -hmm. And that's since the Uhuru House has been there. You go into the YMCA in the African neighborhood in St. Louis, and they have a red, black, and green flag. So It's well, also African flying neighbor. from City Hall. It's flying in City Hall. In City Hall. What? Yes. 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 Uh, uh, Absolutely. This is the revolution. Okay, so... 
There I, we would go. Just, I would just like to say also, if I could, that Uhura Solidarity Movement or even the Black Power Blueprint Reparations Campaign, we want to make a call to all white people who are in the like the solar panel scene or industry. And how can we feel good about having solar plant, et cetera, you know, that we talk about sitting on the pedestal? But this Uhuru House and all the projects, all the other buildings of the Black Power Blueprint need to have solar panels. Why should they be on the grid and have to pay all this? I, I really want to call on anybody who does any of this kind of work. Join. You can, you can um, go to USM. Dot org, Uhura Solidarity. Uhura Solidarity right, you know, you can, yeah, what is, would be the email? Whatever. You can, you can join USM. You can join the Black Power Blueprint. But we, we want to outfit this. Everything that more and more white people take for granted on this stolen land, this land that still belongs to the indigenous people, is completely or more and more off the grid. Well, this needs to be here. There is no reason why the African working class has to be paying for fossil fuels and all that kind of thing and the cost of it which is so tremendous when there's all of these resources out there and we are calling on you if you have anything to do with this environmental to into any gardening resources self-sufficiency resources rainwater harvesting you know just the solar panels let's bring them to the black power blueprint as part of reparations let's do that that would be a powerful thing to do we want you we want you to be part of this that's true yeah I, I really salute that the stance that you're taking and what you're calling for chairman penny has um i i unite mean, anybody that's making money off of creating clean energy right now, that clean energy needs to go to the African working class. It needs to go to colonized humanity, to the people yeah. who primarily have borne the brunt of this environmental destruction that goes hand in hand with colonialism, imperialism, and parasitic capitalism. It's And I, I really appreciate, I want to echo what Chair Jesse said in saluting your presentation, uh, Chairwoman Penny. I, I think so often we hear either on one extreme complete denial people are mm -hmm. sticking their heads in the right. sand right and you know yeah burying themselves in their bunkers and on the other hand you have people like you know crying the sky is falling and there's nothing we can do right, right. like it's judgment day right. your overview is so uh, characteristic of african internationalism mm -hmm. in that it didn't delve into any idealism yeah. any kind of speculation uh it, it dealt exactly with the facts but still with that optimistic conviction that solutions exist right. and can be implemented if we just get rid of this parasitic beast that yeah. has its boot on the neck of humanity called white power call it capitalism colonialism it's the same thing call it environmental uh, climate change they're they're so intertwined and as white people so often we want to just make it some simplistic question of like population control. Right. That's that's a really oh, easy yeah. one. Oh yeah. Well, that's people. genocide. <laughs> that is another word for genocide. Genocide. That's exactly is it, what is you're that talking about. White yeah. population. No, exactly. And right. it, it doesn't take into account what you said, which is that the average white person consumes what, 35 times. White child. The, yeah. the average white child consumes 35 times the amount of resources uh, of an average colonized child. So yeah. it's it's us. It's not the question of the number of human beings. It's right. the lifestyle, the exactly. parasitic lifestyle exactly. of gluttony. And for what? We're mm -hmm. doing this at the expense of our own children's future as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's only colonized people we see that are really thinking about the future, thinking about being responsible towards this planet. And it makes sense to me because, it, as has been said over and over, they have borne the brunt. If you look at things like just the uh, most polluted states in this nation, quote unquote, of the yeah. United States, the, mo the least polluted states, if I'm not mistaken, are Vermont and Maine. Mm -hmm. The most polluted states are places like Alabama, Mississippi, um, you know, Louisiana. So look like at Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan. Yep. And these are all cities notorious for having large concentrations of African people, especially in, in particular the African working class. 
Yeah, and I wanted to just add to that list of cities, St. Petersburg, Florida, yes. where if you want to see greenwashed capitalism at its finest, mm-hmm. you can need look no further than our mayor, mm-hmm. uh, Richard Kreisman, who actually received an award from mm-hmm. some, I don't remember what it was, but from some environmentalist agency for being one of the top 10 greenest mayors oh in, the, in the country. Is that and, what you call for putting sewage in the water in the, right, exactly. in the bay? Is that part of being green? <laughs> it's because it's because he How puts solar panels on the police station. Oh, God, yeah. He's been very, very green with the one exception of polluting everybody's water. Right, starting with the African community where he right. dumped sewage all over Clam Bayou. So, I mean, and he was endorsed by the Sierra Club. You know, which was founded by what's his name, genocidal white nationalist colonizer. Um, what's the guy's name? The uh, John founders. Muir. John Muir. John I Muir. Think. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, it's just very obvious. And and you know, Sherwin Penny, you've talked before about how mm-hmm. even what they call the conservation conservationist movement mm-hmm. was part of the colonization of Africa mm-hmm. and, and part, part of, of imperialism. Yes. Theodore Roosevelt, one of the biggest, was the biggest conservation who made all the national parks and was there in the time of John Muir and, you know, used to bring, force the indigenous people to dress up in their feathers and ride horses in, in <clears throat> front of uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, you know, as the conquest. Oh, this is part of what we we own. But I, yeah. I just want to. I just yeah. I just really appreciate this discussion and to say again and to make it really clear, the answer is not oh, okay. So what we have to do now is have an individual smaller carbon footprint. Right. As they call it. I mean that that is ridiculous. You know that yeah. maybe your you yourself would feel better, but you're still on stolen land. You're still on the pedestal on the backs of African people. The only thing that is going to change this is to bring imperialism, parasitic capitalism, white power down. And the only thing yeah. that's going to bring it down is the leadership of the colonized African working class in unity with Africans here and around the world and with all oppressed and colonized peoples everywhere. That is the way white power will never do it. We've all been sold out everything, the interests of the entire world for our own bellies and pocketbooks. We're not gonna save this. We have to recognize that when African and indigenous people have power, when they're free, that is gonna save the earth. That is the only answer. And we owe reparations and we've gotta pay it. So let's make it, let's bring in those solar panels and yes. everything else that we can and bring it to the Black Power Blueprint. You know, call let's us. Go to, yes. Uhuru. Uhuru, I totally unite. And let's go ahead to blackpowerblueprint.org. We've got about 15 minutes left, and we do have uh, some announcements that we want to make before we close out. But I really want to urge people who are watching to to, you know, go ahead and contribute reparations to the Black Power Blueprint. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of things on these web shows. We've talked about the school system. We've talked about the environment. We've talked about the prison system. We've talked about the police. And the reason why we're able to cover such a wide gamut of subject matter is because African internationalism, the African revolution, is the solution to all of them. Because yes. all of it happens in the context of that same system of parasitic capitalism that Chairwoman Penny just so you know, eloquently uh, defined and described. So, you know, everything comes under this umbrella, and that's why the Black Power Blueprint is the solution, and we have to go ahead and and put in our resources. And, you know, we have $190 left to raise, so we really want to urge people to go ahead, and we, we want to announce it on the air. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I'm eating right now, I'll come back and do it later, you know, take a break for a second, Come over, put in your donation, because yes. we want to thank yes. you while we're live. Yes. Uh, and we can't do it unless we see your contribution come in on blackpowerblueprint.org, and then we get a little text message from our uh, financial whiz, Comrade Amanda. So <laughs> go ahead you, Amanda. and make your contribution. For real. <laughs> so, Carol Penny, before we go into the announcements, anything else that you wanted to raise on this issue tonight? No, I mean, there's, there's a lot more to say, but I, I think that we've said the you know, the crux of it and the fact that we can understand this because we adopt African internationalism, the political theory and understandings of the African People's Socialist Party reflecting the African working class 
and the worldview of the African working class, we can adopt that as our own. And then, you know, we begin to see how just, you know, just what we really are, you know, these opportunist buffoons sitting at the expense of everybody else and trying to impose our worldview onto everybody else. It's like, huh? You know, um, and, and it's more than that, you know, who want to fight for their liberation and their freedom and going to and doing it because this resistance is happening now. And they're bringing the narrative of the African working class onto the political agenda. I mean, you know, just the fact that, that like you mentioned Maine and Vermont, but they just voted to end um, Columbus Day and get rid of, of Christopher Columbus statues and are going to call October 12th Indigenous Peoples Day. Well, that's not, a, I mean, that's not going to end imperialism, but what that is is indicative of the narrative of the oppressed and colonized indigenous people. And oppressed people were saying, no, our story, our point of view is going to, is, is going to be the, the mainstream right here. You know, yes. and forcing it onto that. So that is a sign of these times. Just like the chairman going viral all over Africa as we speak. You know, this is a sign of this time that the former subjects of history, us, because we were the victors, the, con the conquerors that wrote the history books, well, now the so called objects of history are becoming the subjects and determining what the narrative of this planet is going to be through their resistance and struggle. Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru. Chairwoman Penny Hess. Yes. So if, if this has uh, moved you, if, if you're out there and, and you're hearing this message, and in particular, I, I, I really want to put forward again Chairwoman Penny Hess's presentation, in particular for its optimism, Yes, to be optimistic about the future in in a world where we're seeing permanent warfare, some mm -hmm. of the longest open military invasions on the part of the U.S. into mm -hmm. other countries that we've seen in history, um, some some of the most dire predictions of environmental collapse, and yet this organization sees a bright future, sees a shining future, and that's only the kind of uh, optimistic outlook that you can get from an African working class that has been through hell for 600 right. years to build this system. And if yes. you have any delusions that this is not a, an accurate and scientific theory, African internationalism, do the research yourself. See what imperialism has done. That they have known about this problem since at least 1970. Since 1990, they've known it in detail, mm -hmm. how bad things are. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, in the early 90s, they had electric cars ready to go yep. that several car companies destroyed. Yes. They mm -hmm. destroyed them to set back electric cars and hybrid cars for at least a decade so they could get everything together and do what? Make sure that it could make them a maximum profit because that is all parasitic capitalism cares about mm -hmm. and it's all it cares about now. So whatever face it puts on, to whatever extent it, it uh, co-ops, appropriates the language of the African Revolution, we cannot trust parasitic capitalism. No, nope. The only force on the planet we can trust is the leadership of the African working class, yeah. the colonized mass of humanity, because it's in their interests. It mm -hmm. has always been in their interests. Right. But it just makes sense, and it's, it, it's so refreshing to have something uh, to look forward to. To be able to look forward to going to blackpowerblueprint.org and making your contribution, putting your feet firmly on the side of colonized humanity, the African working class of the future. That's the only answer for us as white people as far as I see it. And tonight we are also joined by people in Washington, D.C., including James White, who put in $25. Woo! And uh, Ruby Gittleson in Philadelphia uh, is in touch. Um, she's a, a major supporter of the Black Power Blueprint, yes, longtime member yes. of the Solidarity Movement. And she's trying to put in a contribution, but facing some website difficulties. So hopefully that's not happening <laughs> to other people as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we plan to be in touch with Ruby and get that worked out because she's attempting to put in $25. So All right, Ruby. Ruby. So that means we only have to raise 140 more dollars. Oh my God! In the next That's nine so easy. minutes. How much? 
140. In order to bring, in order to unlock our ma matching reparations fund, right. distributed by the room of lovely people I am joined by right now. So, um, so let's go ahead and do that. Blackpowerblueprint.org, and um, if you're having an issue with the website, uh, please let us know as well in the comments, and we want to, you know, be in touch with you to figure out what's going on. So. Yeah. Um, $140, and I think we have some announcements. So sure. uh, while we're going through our announcements, um, please feel free to uh, interject at any time by going to blackpowerblueprint.org and submitting your payment of reparations. And if you want to go ahead and put in $140 and close it out. Go ahead. Just... Go ahead. <laughs> that would be beautiful. Let's, let's get on the anti-colonial time clock. Time, Blackpowerblueprint.org. Yeah, yeah, blackpowerblueprint.org. That's where you go. So, uh, the following announcements. Saturday, April 27th, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., is the 8th Annual Uhuru Health Festival and Flea Market in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It will be taking place in Clark Park uh, with keynote speaker, Chairman Omalia Shatella, and special guest speaker, Deputy Chair Ona Zanea Shatella. Again, that's Saturday... I believe uh, Chairman Penny it, it will be speaking as well. Fantastic. I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. All right. We have confirmation as well as Chairwoman of the African People's Solid Solidarity Committee, Penny S. So don't miss that Saturday, April 27th, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., the Uhuru Health Festival and Flea Market in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's in Clark Park. Eighth annual. That is incredible. It it is. Is. It's, wow. it's an incredible institution. We've been very territory. When we, when we go to tables uh, locally here, people from Philadelphia, they know Uhuru Furniture, yep. and, and they know this flea market and festival. That's amazing. So also, on April 27th in Chicago, Illinois, in PDOM, which stands for the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, or Freedom Movement, is hosting an event titled the Black People's Grand Jury Viewing Rally, Justice for Laquan McDonald. This is from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. at the Thurgood Marshall Public Library in response to the police murder of Laquan McDonald. And if I'm not mistaken, he was the young man who was murdered uh, by police openly just walking like yeah. something like 15 yeah. to 20 feet away yeah. from a cop yeah. and he barely looks at it and, yeah. and the cop whips around and unloads his gun yeah. into this yeah. young african murdering him right there on the street yep. um so it's it's just a blatant example of, of colonial lynching colonial murder and jamie i, I just want to announce that um the uh, Saturday, April 27th, we have every Saturday, actually, uh, one of our great comrades, Valerie Bronte, hosts the Burning Spear Study uh, for the Solidarity Movement. And that is a weekly study of the Burning Spear. We read articles from the Spear and we discuss them. Um, and this is, of course, the oldest uh, revolutionary African news newspaper in existence that represents the voice of the African working class. And that is live streamed at Facebook.com slash Uhuru Solidarity. Six excellent. Excellent. Facebook.com slash Uhuru Solidarity. Is there a YouTube option as well for that at the moment? Not at the moment. Okay. We'll, we'll be returning to YouTube shortly. And this is a busy movement. Yeah. Monday, April 29th, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., the Uhuru Vanguard Book Tour will be stopping in Philadelphia for a book reading and signing with Chairman Omalia Shatella of his yeah. recent book titled Vanguard, the political report to the African People's Socialist Party's 7th Congress. And this is taking place at Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books on wow. 5445 Germantown Avenue. Yes. That's, yeah, that's uh, Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books on 5445 Germantown Avenue. And that sounds great. It really does. Chance to get the chairman's new book, to get it signed, and uh, meet the chairman there. And again, this is Monday, April 29th, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Uhuru Vanguard Book Tour that's stopping in Philadelphia. And then right the night after that, is an event hosted by the Uhuru Solidarity Movement featuring our very own Chairwoman Penny Hess, which is called Make America Pay Reparations. That will be um, Tuesday, April 30th at 7 p.m. at the Community Room of the William Way LGBT Community Center, mm -hmm. which is at 1315 Spruce Street in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And that will be a multimedia presentation on the true history and necessity 
of the growing movement for white people's reparations to the African community. Beautiful. And while you're frantically getting out your wallet and going to blackpowerblueprint.org to help us reach our goal tonight, we also want to let you know that Wednesday, May 1st, is Give St. Louis Day. Yes. So give, give St. Louis Day is a 24 hours of online giving intended to shine the spotlight on the St. Louis, Missouri region's nonprofit organizations. And we happen to be raising awareness and funds for one right now. So this will be a great opportunity to increase awareness and a base of support for the African People's Education and Defense Fund, the baddest little nonprofit on the planet. And its Ooh. mission its Black Power Blueprint projects in St. Louis. Yeah. Check it out at APEBS Give St. Louis Day. That's Give STL Day. Page at APEDF.org slash Give STL Day. And you can start spreading the word and mark your calendar to donate on May 1st. And just when you thought we were done making announcements, <laughs> we also want to announce that on Saturday, May 4th, the Uhuru Festival in Oakland, California, taking place in Aquaba Hall Uhuru on Health 7th. Festival. Uhuru Health Festival. The Health Festival. Festival. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. The Health Festival. And um, that is happening on, like I said, Saturday, May 4th it's in amazing. Oakland, California, Aquaba Hall. Uh, 7911 MacArthur Boulevard from 12 to 3 p.m. And that includes free health screenings, traditional and alternative health care information and demonstration, yeah. children's activities, food, music, giveaways, fitness demonstrations, and more. So that sounds amazing as well. Don't miss out on that one. But if you should, Thursday, May 16th to Sunday, May 19th, Come out to Oakland, California and volunteer with the legendary Uhuru Foods at the San Mateo Maker Fair in Oakland, California. Volunteers are needed for the large outdoor concession booths to support Black Power Blueprint and Black Star Industries projects. And, uh, vol- sorry, um, concessions, this is a, a great experience to have uh, to be involved with yes. Uhuru Foods. Uhuru Foods and Pies will provide housing and local transportation if you need that and for more information and to sign up you can contact uhuru foods at 800-578-5157 that's 800-578-5157 or you can go to oakland at uhurufoods.org that's oakland at u-h-u-r-u foods.org Uhuru, Uhuru Foods and Pies. All right. All right, Uhuru. Yeah, it continues to grow. And then following that, Saturday, May 25th, and Sunday, May 26th in Washington, D.C., the African People's Socialist Party is hosting their annual African Liberation Day. This is an event an event themed Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. Death to Imperialist White Power. Sure. And it will include a march and presentations by Chairman Omalia Shatella and African Socialist International Secretary General Luwezi Kinshasa, wow. taking place on Saturday at Union Temple Baptist Church on 1225 West Street Southeast. If I'm getting that right, that's uh, Temple Baptist Church at 1225 West west street southeast and sunday at the stewart center on 821 barnum street northeast you can visit aldhuru.org for more information that's ald as in african liberation day uhuru.org Uhuru. and if you're planning on going to all of these events but you're worried that by the end of it you might be a little tired and you might want a vacation you can sign up for the marcus garvey legacy <laughs> cruise the annual yeah. fundraiser held to support the work of the African Socialist International. So you can actually be involved in reparations to the African Socialist International by going on a cruise. So how they are. Yeah. And this is an organization, African Socialist International, is led by Louise Kinshasa, the Secretary General, who you just mentioned. And it's a worldwide organization of African people in every uh, part of the world who are fighting to overturn the conditions faced by African people. And this year, the cruise will be taking off on December 14th through the 19th and will be sailing on the uh, Carnival Sunrise from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, staying over
overnight in Havana, Cuba. Yes. And Nassau, Bahamas. So I'm going to um, be there. That is going to be. I'll be there as well. And <laughs> registration is now open. Deposits can be made by calling travel agent Linda Stern at 732-972-4171. So, wow. Hooray. There is no other way to visit uh, the revolutionary island of Cuba yes. than to do so with the African People's Socialist Party. I yes, guess. indeed. With the chairman. If, if you have any way of yeah. making that happen, make it happen this year. That That sounds just... I can't imagine something more exciting. So, so how are we doing? So we well, raised we're 140 big. yet? No, we haven't gotten any more contributions. Yeah. I think um, people well, might have dropped their debit cards. They were so excited when they went to blackpowerblueprint.org. Maybe their computers <laughs> ran out of battery or something. But on a serious note, we do want to encourage people, if you haven't contributed, to to go ahead and, and put in a donation towards $140. And, and let's make this um, 500 tonight. We Let's can do, do this. this. Let's do we it. We can do this. And, and if you did have a problem, if you made an attempt to donate and there was a, it didn't go through, please let us know. We, we want to make sure that time was not wasted, that your your unity was not wasted. If there's a problem with the website, we'll fix it. But uh, we need to know if you're having a problem. So how, how do they do that again, Justin? Um, you can you can email. Um, Hmm. Who should they email? Well, let's start with, you can email info at uhurusolidarity.org if you're having an issue with the website, and I will make sure that that gets to um, the technicians of the Black Power People website so we can see if that's a problem. Although Ruby is saying that she she thinks that she made the contribution, but she didn't get a confirmation email, so I'm not sure. Okay, so we'll, we'll be in touch with Ruby about that, but we really appreciate Ruby's contribution. Mm -hmm. So, James? All right. Well, I really want to appreciate uh, and salute Chairwoman Penny Hess and uh, all the comrades out there in St. Louis that helped to make this uh, webinar a possibility. I want to appreciate our, our studio uh, and Dylan. audience. Dylan. Hey, yes. Comrade Dylan, I want to salute you in particular, Comrade Uhuru. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic to have you on this team. Yes. Uh, the reparations movement. And uh, Chair Jesse Neville, do you have any uh, last words before we... Yes, um, I just want to say that I will be putting in $25 uh, tonight as part of the mysterious matching fund collective in this room. So I'm, I'm very proud to be uh, contributing to the Black Power Blueprint, and um, it is the most positive thing happening on the planet Earth. It really is. And, it really is, yeah. You know, you look around you, and, you know, I just think where I would be if I didn't have the leadership of the African working class. And I'm sure I would be going through various, the various stages of climate grief um, and other forms of, you know, um, you know, bourgeois despair that is absent a vision of the future that only the African revolution has in mind. So, and a plan to bring into reality. So I'm, I'm very honored and grateful to be a part of this and um, thank Chairwoman Penny Hess for the amazing presentation as always. And, I uh, want to let people know to tune in next week to Black Power Blueprint's Facebook page and YouTube.com slash Black Power Blueprint because Deputy Chair Ona Zane Yashitella herself will be joining us for a live discussion on the Black Power Blueprint's history and future. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and Chairwoman Benny, did you want to say anything before we close out tonight? Just want to say unity through reparations. reparations. Uhuru, uhuru, comrades. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Hooray, hooray.